So uh, the next session is for uh, question and answers. Uh, we will open uh, to the floor. Uh, according to our registration list, uh, we have the many colleagues from think tank, from private sector, and uh, also from media and uh, yeah, uh, from NGO. So I think we tapped a lot of issue uh, which could be uh, discussed. So uh, uh, firstly, I would like to collect uh, several questions, three or four questions, and uh, we give a first round answer, and then, then we can yeah, yeah, collect the next uh, round question. And uh, please uh, shortly uh, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, please uh, take your question in two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Camille Chow. I'm from the International Climate Development Institute. And uh, I participate in the COP meeting uh, since 10 years ago, every year. And also, I have uh, the uh, privilege to invite it to the, uh, the Future Earth and uh, MIT uh, Cooperation Project for uh, the Future Project for 2050. So uh, thank you for a very good presentation from Professor Naki and also uh, two colleagues from Taiwan, Professor Wu and uh, uh, the manager. But uh, I was wondering, because we uh, have a lot of very good uh, initiative and the policy transformation for uh, SDGs, and we're trying to do that. But uh, in the meantime, um, it may cost some, uh, maybe the living cost increasing. And uh, so a lot of people and a lot of enterprise, they uh, have some objection for that. But on the other way, if we would like to uh, put forward for this uh, sustainable policies, that also may increase some cost for some uh, maybe uh, vulnerable people, vulnerable groups. And although they are suffering for that, but if we increase some uh, living costs for them, for instance, we rise in the energy cost, energy tax, uh, carbon pricing, and how do we balance this um, moving forward and also maybe uh, attract them to support our new initiative? Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Oh, good morning. Um, my name is Phaedra Fum, and I'm uh, currently working in National Taiwan Museum and also studying in the PhD program of uh, the International Program of Sustainable uh, Climate Change and Sustainable Development in NTU. And I'm also currently the secretary of ICOM Natist. And uh, I have a question for Professor Nagi. So uh, from your message, you repeatedly mentioned the concept of digital Anthropocene. So what is the major difference between Anthropocene and digital Anthropocene? Thank you. Hi. Um, just a question about what's the um, uh, the most um, relevant and important uh, research and development priorities in terms of uh, more sustainable internet and mobile phones. I mean, because I'm based in China as a Taiwanese scholar, um, we are pushing the agenda of uh, eco design of internet, uh, facing this kind of a um, phenomenon happening, like in areas of urban mining mobile phones re recycling, even app redesigns, right? So just wondering um, what's in your different uh, sphere, what's kind of the most important agenda or most important efforts you see that is kind of important within three or five year frame? Thank you. So we uh, collect the, the first three questions and uh, we have the question uh, from online. I think that this maybe is the question to Professor Naki. What do you make of the funding, uh, uh, findings that increase in the energy efficiency in a complex adaptive system uh, doesn't seem to decrease, but increase absolutely energy consumption? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the really good uh, questions uh, and discussion points. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Of course, not so easy. Uh, let me start in the reverse order. The first, the internet question. If I understood it correctly, it had to do with the fact that people in the urban areas will probably have much higher energy demand and therefore higher emissions than in the rural areas. Now that's an interesting question. We, in the, we conducted a few years ago the global energy uh, assessment that you can also download from the website with about 300 scientists. And one of the interesting results on energy was <coughs> we, we studied representative cities from the global north and global south. Now, let me start with the global north. In global north, cities are more efficient than sprawl in the rural areas. That's quite interesting. So in the north, if you live in the urban area, you have a lower footprint than the other co-citizens who work in the rural areas. In the global south, it's exactly the opposite. When you move to the cities, on average, you have a much higher footprint. So that, of course, can be a concern because most of the urbanization will be happening in the global south in the future. Therefore, again, like all of the other challenges we have, we have to make sure that the cities become much, much more sustainable. On the other hand, you know, I would also argue that maybe that's not so bad because, you know, the standard of living of people has to increase. So, you know, more energy would make sense to me to uh, uh, provide decent life for everybody as long as that energy does not generate local and global emissions and climate change and the problem. So that would be my answer. I think moving to the cities can improve human life and people move to the cities, but we just have to make sure that the imprint on the environment is not so high. Now, the, the third question was, I don't know whether it was addressed to me, but, you know, internet and sustainability relationship. Um, you know, I think I've tried to argue in my talk that it can go both directions. You know, internet of things means that you might have a mi much higher demand for energy and for other services for the devices. At the same time, my hope is that the internet can facilitate very flexible, real-time, how shall I call it, organization of systems, and therefore reduce the footprint of our activities. So, you know, I, I think one can just only express the hope. Um, I, I see a bigger, bigger problem of the internet in the sense of the privacy, infringement of individual freedoms. Um, I think these are the concerns that we need to have, that, you know, I mean, the new cars, well, mobile phone alone, besides all of the great things, always knows where you are. <laughs> and many other devices, if, if the refrigerator will know what you eat and, and so on. So I, I see the dangers of internet more in that area. Um, the digital Anthropocene question, I, I, it, you know, it's a metaphor. I mean, Anthropocene, in my view, you know, started maybe 50 years ago, 1970s, 1980s. I mean, we have not decided yet what the formal date is, I would say it started in the 70s with so-called great acceleration, when almost all consumption went up. Energy, you know, uh, uh, carbon emissions, uh, uh, food, almost every, every area you look of human activities, it went up. So I think that's the beginning of the Anthropocene, with major infringement on the Earth systems. The reason why we call it symbolically digital Anthropocene is because the digital technologies can make the Anthropocene sustainable, but they can also make it go in the wrong direction, as we discussed before. So I think that that is the answer to that question. And, and the first question was about the costs, really important. So yes, um, I, I would say that the advantage of SDG, Sustainable Development Agenda, is that it's about the people and the planet. So it is about equity. Equity and justice is really important, and security and uh, dignity. That's very important in the agenda. Uh, so some of the things that we need to do will increase costs, there is no doubt. Um, in particular, if you look at it the other way around, you know, it's estimated the energy system today, just as an example, um, the cost of the energy are on the order of about 1.7, 1.8 trillion worldwide. And those costs will probably double as we invest into the new technologies, but the operating costs will be lower. But compared to that sum, 
we spend about 500 billion to a trillion on energy subsidies, and they go mostly to fossil energy, and I know that there are also subsidies in Taiwan. So once we remove the subsidies, which I think is a must, we have to see how to protect people who will be negatively affected. I think that's the answer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm economist by training, and I would argue it's if people are well educated and aware, it's better to increase their income than to subsidize certain things of consumption. So we need better safety nets, escape hatches for people who might be to protect the poor, essentially. In particular, energy, food, these are the important, you know, the important means of life. So that would be my answer. Some costs will be higher in, at the beginning. In the long run, I believe the cost will be substantially lower, uh, but we need to protect at the beginning people who might be excluded. Well, Professor Nagy probably answered all the questions very well. But I just want to add a comment about the third question. I think you were uh, asking about what's the priority during the production of those products. And there's a concept uh, mentioned uh, uh, recently and highlighted by actually the policy of the research community in Taiwan. It's about the so-called circular economy. So the, they are really working hard to try to not to produce or the byproduct of any ma manufacturing process would be useful for the, the another product, and in a way we should reduce the waste. So that will be very helpful to make the product more or greener or green product. I think that is another that is a very important uh, concept and to be implemented into our industry. Thank you.我这边补充两点啊因为刚刚有提到就是说就是科技的关系所以就是网络隐私的部分其实相对的重要那每个人随身带着的手机他每天跟着你到底他知道你多少然后你又希望他知道你多少或是别人知道多少所以其实以我们
就有有有行无事，我们想想买编的预算想买，但是其实好像听到的几乎都是买不到来做，呃，然后更何况是做底底碳的这个动作，这些部分对企业来讲也是一个相对性的困扰。那这这方面也有待呃，就是大家一起的努力这样。以上，谢谢。周经理这个问题其实就牵涉到我们的能源转型太慢哈，所以我们的再生能源根本就不够量哈。我们到今年最新的数据，我们再生能源大概五点五六帕，扣掉灌肠水力大概只有三点多帕。So our energy transition is the far far lagged behind to the world. Actually, we have the very small capacity for electricity run. Renewable energy. So, so this is also the debate yesterday. yesterday. So that actually we see that uh, the society, according to our long-term observation to all the survey conducted in Taiwan and uh, the, the some other component, we see the society and uh, the uh, cooperatives are eager to transform uh, their activity to connect the international yeah, SDG. Uh, 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 framework, but uh, our government or our governments are uh, okay, act very slow. So I think that is very important uh, issues. I think uh, Professor Naki also published uh, one uh, the, the article also urged that uh, for the SDG transformation, the very important component is governments. How can we actually uh, arrive at a social con consensus? Arrived the, the social, uh, you know, commitment uh, uh, through some uh, communication for one society is very important. So my so my one key question to Professor Knacki is uh, how can TWI 2050 uh, framework, particularly the six uh, uh, major uh, transformation components, to apply it to. Uh, Different national uh, scales, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, development. I think this is uh, very important for every country. So this is my quest first question. So sorry, I use my privilege for <laughs> giving that <laughs> the first question. We will just take some questions, okay? Hey, Chen Yeah, uh, Professor Na Naki, I'm I'm very happy. To to uh, to to see your new report. That's about the digital revolution and the sustainable development. And in the subtitle, you you talk about opportunities and uh, and uh, and the challenge or risks. And and I like to know how to I, I, with because uh, this is about sustainability. Then um, we are afraid to see the digital revolution will. Uh, in the future, will be uh, have uh, some similar kind of a uh, consequence as the uh, uh, industrial revolution. All of the problem com begins with industrial revolution, and the digital revolution is uh, is a new kind and revolution. Maybe it will be have a similar kind of uh, challenge and uh, and risk to our society, economy, and the earth. And I, 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 I find that you have uh, a lot of discussion about this, and uh, and uh, of course we have uh, opportunities, but that's not important. Important is the challenge and the risks. How to make the best, and uh, uh, from the digital revolution, and then avoid those risks uh, in the environment, in in economy and in society and in political uh, systems yeah and human rights and a lot of problems yeah Thank you. Uh, Alan Wei from New Taipei City Government um, actually our city just published the very first SDG voluntary local report in Taiwan uh, just a couple months ago my question is uh, Professor, you mentioned briefly about urbanization, and uh, since our very first step is to publish the report, what would be your recommendations for us to work uh, furthermore with uh, research institutions or 
the international community to truly embed the idea of SDGs into our policies and what we can do more. Thank you. Yes, we have another question from Slido. The, the question is for Professor Naki. Can you speak t a, a lot more to the role of degrowth, as well as the importance of the integrating traditional ecological knowledge with Western science in attaining SDGs? The role of the degrowth. Okay, thank you, sorry about this. Um, so let me also start now with the last question because it's perhaps most, most difficult to respond to. It is about the degrowth idea. And you know, my understanding of the degrowth idea is that <coughs> our market economies, in particular in the last phases of neoliberalism, are basically based on growth. I mean, you just read the newspapers and you'll see everybody is worried as soon as the GDP doesn't grow. As, as we have seen it in the past, but the growth in that sense also means more material consumption. Some of the consumption is virtual, like education and science is not that material intensive or carbon intensive, but most of the other activities are material intensive. So, you know, I don't have an answer clearly, but, um, you know, I've worked a lot with people who have been worried about this issue. So my take is the following. It depends what's growing. <laughs> because at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we changed the measure of the GDP, the ba basket of goods and services on which GDP is measured, changes over time because our economies change. Now, if that basket in the future involves much more virtual things, things that improve our life but do not necessarily require material consumption, then it's still conceivable to have growth but have a degrowth of material consumption. And you talked about circular economy, that's part of it, in improving the metabolism of our economies, recycling goods and services uh, for mobile phones, for example, that's a big challenge for the cars as well. How to make the products that can improve over time without completely throwing them away or recycling them. So uh, my answer to that is we need to strive material degrowth. That means dematerialization, decarbonization, uh, but that may not mean that we don't have the growth in other areas of human activities, no matter how we might be measuring that in the future. Uh, <coughs> the, the second question was about um, digitalization report and you know how, how can we, I think, or comment rather, on, you know, how can we make sure that digitalization offers the opportunities and we avoid the great dangers of digi digitalization that are inherent. Um, you know, I was just last week, as mentioned before, in Japan, you know, that our friends in Japan have this notion of society 5.0. Um, you know, I think it's symbolically n a, a good notion because SDGs means primarily that we have to change ourselves. <laughs> it's not something external, it's part of us at every single level. So we are talking about the new society, the new revolution in human development. As I said before, we call it digital revolution or digital Anthropocene, but it just means that this technology needs to go in the right direction before we are in the situation like with the last phase of the Great Acceleration since the 1970s, where really m the human society through development went into also destroying the basis of our development. And so I think that that's the really challenge. How to, your difficult question of how to apply this <laughs> at the local level is a tough one. Let me just tell you that I was at a meeting about two months ago of the Ban Ki-moon Center uh, the Secretary General has now a center about the world citizenship and applying SDGs. There was a colleague from Slovakia, a small country next to Austria. They're using a similar six transformations as we do for their planning. 
So I would say my view is wherever governments at what local, regional, global level can apply all of the 17 SDGs and their 169 targets, so much the better. But we need better science for that. We need, si we need to provide science and make sure that what we talk about is consistent. And this is why we propose the six transformations. They can hopefully make all of that much simpler. You know, Einstein, Albert Einstein has said once, if you cannot explain a problem in simple terms, that means you don't understand it. I think we are still in that phase of how to simplify it and not lose the deep understanding. And then quickly, um, because the time is running, on urbanization. Now, urbanization is probably one of the strongest, um, I, I would, strongest forces in human development right now. Uh, people perceive opportunities and good life if they move to the cities and ever more are moving into the cities. Um, I, I think indication is very strong that that will continue. Um, here, the problem is that we, when we think about urbanization, we often think about the great urban corridors, like say Tokyo, Osaka, or something like that. Um, but in reality, most people in urban settlements live in small to medium-sized cities. So that doesn't make the problem easier, because that means you have to operate at all levels. I mean, the distribution of of urban areas is relatively constant for last thousand years. The relationship of the biggest to the smallest urban areas. That means that much more attention has to be done also on the smaller cities. Uh, I think big cities probably have a bigger capacity of achieving sustainability through planning, roadmaps, closing the metabolism. It is in the smaller cities that some of the challenges really occur uh, because they don't have so much uh, political power. So I would say that's related to the question of government. I think it is important that um, our governance provides clear and transparent rules of engagement. I think that's the most important, to have a level playing field for everybody. And that includes, I think, also small communities, not just the big one. But, you know, in some ways, we have to be more active. I, I was shamed recently. I was invited in our village, I live in a village, uh, to talk with, uh, with our poly parties at the local level. And I was shocked to find out that our village has the 17 sustainability goals on its target for development. I didn't know and I lived there. So, you know, we all have to be much, much more aware. <laughs> So, uh, the, is any question for that? Okay. Okay. So, hi, and um, I'm from the Institute of Sociology, uh, Academia Seneca, and I my question uh, follows the some of the previous questions, which focus on the more challenging side of transformation. So. Uh, my question is for Professor Naki. Uh, so thank you for bringing us this uh, aspiring talk, especially when you point out the six uh, major transformations. All these transformations are rather systematic changes, not only require an integrated policy and uh, also the support from political circle but also the rearrangement of the current social and material orders. And put it short, it changes people's life and the behaviors. So as you said in the talk, there are two kinds of change patterns. One is the incremental and the, the another one is disruptive. So my question is why we should perceive these new ideas and the artifacts as disruptive. So taking the electrical vehicles, for example, it, uh, uh, it already existed in the 1970s and the 80s, and the result of deploying them to all the society was not a success in France. But having said that, as we can see in the kingdom of scooters, Taiwan, the recent development is the total number of electric Gogoro scooters has reached around uh, 210,000. 
So it's quite an achievement, given that it's not achieved in a way of co co uh, cohesion, coercion, sorry. Not depending on pure governmental policy force, like the case in China. I mean, although electric vehicles or digital revolution, like you mentioned, can make the goal of sustainable development come into reality, but how it is implemented is also crucial. So my question again, shouldn't we see all these major transformations as a locally envisioned roadmap, treating them as an incremental change? not necessary with a clear root map, but with the public input and the responding to the possible local and the controversies and the challenges. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick. Um, I run a, uh, I help to run a small business in Taiwan, and at the same time, um, I'm employed by a very large uh, tech company. So um, when we talk about transformation, um, it's by definition um, easier to achieve in a small company. But in our big company, um, we're seeing consolidation throughout the field. We're seeing um, companies that as a result become very risk averse. They don't want to transform. They want to hold on to what they have. So how can we um, help to uh, uh, encourage large corporations, which are conservative, um, to buy into the idea of transformation? Uh, hello, I'm a student, uh, now a master's student studying in international sustainable and uh, climate change and sustainable development department. And my question is about uh, the digital world and inform information. Uh, I think uh, we, we mentioned about the uh, materialism problem that a lot of people still are holding as a belief now. So we are trying to change awareness of people. And I think in the digital world, we find that it, it, it is like an attention world that a lot of uh, media or uh, digital uh, information is trying to seize the, inform uh, seize the attention of the people, especially I think in a lot of uh, places in the world, they have the problem of misinformation and disinformation. So uh, I would like to ask a question about the transformation challenge. How do you think the uh, role the digital play and the media play to uh, change people's attentions? I have the question. I try to interlink, interlink to the, the uh, all discussions. I have a question to Professor Wu, because Professor Wu was the, the Director General of Department of Natural Science and Sustainable uh, Development and most. Uh, as we know, the, the, the most has uh, engaged a lot of the, the scientific research about climate change, about disaster, about health. But uh, in that reality, that how can Actually, the, this so kinds of scientific uh, evidence of scientific uh, findings as uh, government's uh, suggestion to other departments, particularly our uh, actually our political leaders that uh, actually has a lack of the mind, the real mind of transformation. Uh, from our view, is uh, for, for example some very important initial policy instrument would not be implemented. For example, energy tax. This is very important for transformation. For example, the uh, ca carbon trading. Carbon trading is a kind of the difficult things, but uh, that uh, energy tax from Professor Xiao Daiji's perspective, this is very important for all kinds of the transformation steps yeah, in Taiwan. And then uh, electricity pr price. I think the, our the leader, should have the, the new view for the actually the transformative world. Not only focus, I say again, not focus, only focus on AIoT and technology development. This is our problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, 
uh, I already finished my service for, uh, for most. Nevertheless, as a scientist back at NTU, uh, I would like just echo what Professor Cho just mentioned. Yeah, uh, we do need very solid fundamental research. But for the sustainable development issue, it's really transdisciplinary. And it involves a lot of different disciplines and expertise. And that, although uh, it was the project was mainly supported in most under the, my department, Department of Natural Science and Sustainable Development, but it requires a lot of integration and synergy among researchers of very different areas. And that is something we have been in the past working hard to promote these type of research. But I have to say and all admit it's never enough. And we need to have very smart strategy about even the limited uh, funding resources we have. So we need to have very smart uh, plans about how this research should be uh, uh, sponsored or should be uh, with collective efforts and uh, should be organized and that is something although it is not under my leadership at this point but I think it is something we will continue to promote and to to provide the feedback to our leadership on top and to support these researches that really address the key issues about the connection to SDGs. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me try to briefly address uh, the, the last two questions that I think are very strongly related. The one about how to make the disruptive change occur, if I understood it correctly, and the other one is who will do it whether it's small or big enterprises. Um, my, my response to that is that generally it is true that small enterprises are more innovative. There is no doubt about that if we look at the history. The trouble is this is evolutionary process. So, you know, there is a quote in the Bible saying, many are called for, but only few are chosen. I mean, that is true with innovation. We need lots of innovations before something is a success and becomes a disruptive or what economists call a big hit, like the automobile or mobile phone. Uh, you know, there are many, many designs. So the history of the phone is very exciting. The history of the cars is very exciting. So uh, I, I would say, in principle, we'll learn from our errors. And the learning curve, ex experience curve, is essentially learning from the errors, how to avoid mistakes and you know, improve the technology, make it che cheaper, make it much better. I think at the beginning, small companies are much better at doing that, small enterprises. The big ones actually usually buy the small ones that are successful. That's the evolutionary process, because the big ones don't want to risk anything, as you said. Um, you know, but that's a exact also a barrier to the development. If you think about electric mobility, whatever form it takes, it's the big companies that are very hesitant. You know, I mean, m most of them have electric vehicles on their program, but if you want, if you go to the showroom and ask to buy one, they will probably advise you not to do so, <laughs> it's even though they can make a sale, uh, because the structural change is huge. Uh, Volkswagen has recently uh, uh, made a statement that if they turn to full electric mobility after the diesel gate, uh, they will have to shed one third of the labor force because electric cars are much simpler. I don't need to say more. That makes the companies, it's the same thing in energy area, big companies very successful. So let me alert you to one thing if you're not aware of it. European community has a program that's called Smart Specialization Strategy, 3S, Smart Specialization Strategy. Look it up on the internet. Uh, the, the reason why I like it, it's an evolutionary economics idea, how do you support innovative small enterprises? That's important everywhere. And they don't have the recipe. None of us know what will be successful. But what they suggest is that one needs to look at every regional level and local level, what are the initial conditions that you have there that might promote innovative activities? 
And I think that that notion, so read about it if you're interested, is very important. So perhaps the process will be we nurture small enterpreneur, uh, ent enterprises that they come with the ideas, the ones that are successful might then eventually replace the big business. Uh, it's very evolutionary, you know, in the ecosystems you have the old trees and the small aggressive plants. When you have the old trees, the new ones cannot grow, but after a fire, or a typhoon or tornado when the big ones die, then the new ones are regenerated. It's a part of the innovation process. So I think we are exhausted our time. Thank you very much for excellent questions and discussion. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lucky, and also thanks to uh, uh, this content, uh, discussion. So I think that, that, uh, that our purpose uh, today is actually we try to uh, advocate uh, the new idea of the uh, 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 transformation uh, to our society, and uh, we try to also uh, uh, connect the linkage to the international uh, knowledge uh, community. So, as uh, according to Future Earth uh, yeah, principle, that uh, all colleagues, yeah, the participant, uh, participate in this uh, forum is uh, we actually uh, the co-produce, yeah, co-deliver, and co-design our. Uh, future version. So thank you much for joining this forum. Okay, thank you.